Are you ready? If you got your Bibles, open to Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, and then Genesis chapter 24, okay? Philippians 1, Genesis 24. So we're starting a new sermon series uh, that we're calling Family Portraits, all right? Uh, uh, this is going to be a very, very practical uh, set of sermons, and today in particular is a very practical message, wonderful uh, message to take notes on. I uh, want to give a disclaimer on the front end. This is how to lay a godly foundation. If there are some of you that are in a circumstance where you have a deeper level relationship uh, where there is not a godly foundation, there is no judgment, but we want to make sure we do it right the next time around, okay? And so uh, this is a great lesson to take notes on. Uh, again, if you are right on the front end of starting some deeper level relationships and you came to the right place today, it doesn't get more practical than what we're going to navigate today. It starts with this question. Have you ever seen a family portrait where there was a lot going on but Beneath the surface before. Uh, have you ever seen a family portrait where there's a lot going on beneath the surface? Uh, in our family, uh, growing up, we had a portrait of, uh, that we used to go in. So back in the day before cell phones took great pictures, you used to go in and like sit down in the mall, all right? And then they would take these pictures. You'd sit on like fake carpet, you know what I mean? And they would take these pictures. Ours in Lubbock was called Olin Mills. You went and got the Olin Mills pictures uh, there in Lubbock. And uh, what they would do is try to make it look, again, just as nice as possible. And so I'll never forget, we had a picture hanging over our mantle. I think I was a sophomore in college. My brother Sam was a junior in high school. Uh, and then our sister Haley uh, was, a, uh, was a, a, a freshman in high school. And so we're all kind of growing up, coming into our own. Got mom and dad there also. And so the picture that hangs over the mantle is just this beautiful, perfect Olin Mills put together, perfect mall picture, mall, mall portrait. However, what happened that same day, just moments after that picture was taken, is what I see every single time I see that family portrait. And mom, I'm, I'm sharing this with you on Mother's Day. It's one of my favorite little family moments that we have, all right? So all that to say, you know how when you're taking a picture with a professional photographer, what do they usually say after they've taken the nice picture? What do they usually tell you? Take a funny one or a silly one, right? Let's take a silly one. And so we don't move at all. And then he goes, come on, let's do a silly one. And at that moment, I don't know why, but what comes across and through my mind is I should slap my dad across the face. That <laughs> is what goes through my mind. Not like angrily, just like that would be really funny. And again, in my 19-year-old sophomore in college brain, it's like... I should do that. And all of a sudden it translates into action and I totally go up and turn around and just slap my dad across the face. Well, at that point, because my dad was a loving and kind man, all of a sudden you have in the snapshot after that a picture of my brother going, huh. I mean, just this goofy laugh. My sister like, did he just do that? And then my mom, she lovingly says, well, the reason we don't have this framed and hanging, my mom is laughing and there's like a double chin laugh. And so she was like, I can't have that one on the wall. All right. Okay, she was very skinny, but again, just couldn't have the double chin lap on the wall. All that to say, whenever I see the family portrait, I see what's beneath the surface, right? I see on that one specifically. Even though it looks put together, image is perfect on the outside, I can see me slapping dad moments later. All right. I share that with you to say this. It's one thing when it's kind of a fun moment. Sometimes you look at a family portrait and it looks perfect on the outside. And guys, underneath the surface, there's abuse. Underneath the surface, there's anger. Underneath the surface, there's frustration, there's hatred sometimes. Sometimes there's just strain. So here's the deal. This next series that we're going to go through, we're calling it Family Portrait, because we're going to look at two brothers, Jacob and Esau, and they were strained from the moment they were born. I mean, from the day the two were born, they were already competing with one another and struggling in this relationship. And somehow, some way, through the leading of Almighty God, we get to see the two brothers make peace and then they forge a path forward. Now, just for the record, most of the studies can be focused on Jacob. But Esau was also on his journey too. And we're going to watch the way the Lord brings the two of them back together. It's going to take a few months for us to go through this verse by verse. But for some of you, my prayer is that the Lord would provide healing and peace where there maybe has not been peace in a family relationship. Are you ready? So if you're taking notes, look over at uh, Philippians chapter 1. And we're going to start in verses 3 through 6. Uh, and that's where we'll begin our study of Jacob and Esau. Look at Philippians 1, 3 through 6. Here's what Paul says about the church. And this particular church, they were like his family, the church at Philippi. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. 
in all my prayers for all of you. Underline, in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Underline and highlight, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to notice this. Paul doesn't say, I thank my God every time I remember the good people at the church of Philippi. He says, I am filled with joy as I remember all of you and all that God has brought you through. That's the good stuff. That's the bad stuff. That's the difficult stuff. Why in the world would he say, I am filled with joy when I consider all of you, even the ones that have caused me problems? He says, because I believe that God is bringing something together to completion. Not just now, but all the way into the time when Christ comes back. We can find joy in knowing that when our lives are a complete and total mess, that God doesn't like to leave loose ends. Amen? He likes to bring things to completion, and that includes in your family situation. Now, I want to give this disclaimer, too. There's no such thing as a perfect family. You hear me? There is no such thing as a perfect family. I've told you this before, even recently, but my dad used to say, if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. All right? The idea is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that means there is no perfect church because there are no perfect people apart from Jesus. So listen, in your family, you're going to hurt each other. In your family, you're going to disappoint one another. In your family, there are going to be times when it's strained. Our God is a God of completion. And he wants to see all of that mess brought to peace. And for some of us, we may just may get to see it within our lifetime but we've got to be willing to trust the Lord and to do it his way. If you're taking notes, write this down. You ready? Whenever an area of your life is a work in progress, remember that we serve a God who likes to complete things. Whenever an area of your life is a work in progress, remember that we serve a God who likes to complete things. It's with that that we're going to jump into our study in Genesis, and today we're going to address this question. How do you lay the foundation for a godly family? How do you lay the foundation for a godly family? Again, if you're in a situation uh, where your foundation is in rough shape, we're going to talk about how to fix that foundation uh, later on. But let's start with this, because we've got a lot of young people here in our church, and a lot of you uh, who aren't necessarily young, maybe you're my age, all right, and you're looking to start something new moving forward. If that's you, this message is for you, and we're going to talk about how to lay the foundation the right way. I can tell you, after having to do foundation work on this building, it's a whole lot better if you do it on the front end than if you got to do it on the back end. It's a whole lot more expensive. It takes a whole lot more time if you got to do it on the back end. Let's talk about how to do it the right way from the very beginning. But you got to promise me, if you got a troubled foundation right now, we're going to get into that in the weeks to come. For now, I just need you to know we're talking about how you lay the foundation when you plan it out right. Are you ready? How, does that, how, do, how do you lay a godly foundation for a godly family? Um, one other thing, if you don't have, uh, don't write anything else down uh, through this study, I hope you'll write this down. Are you ready? This is a big, this big, big, uh, big moment. You ready? When Jesus does something, we copy it. And when anyone else in Scripture does something, we consider it. Please write that down, okay? Because we're going to jump back to Jacob and to Esau and to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob. And here's the deal. Sometimes, because that's a big, powerful biblical name, we can think of it in the same vein as Jesus. If Jesus does it, we copy it because he was perfect. If anyone else in Scripture does it, we consider it because they are still fallible man and still make mistakes. We're going to read through this passage, and as we go through, there's going to be some weird stuff that we come through that sounds like it was of God when the truth was it was of man. And even though God is the focus, even though Yahweh is the focus, we don't need to copy it. We need to consider it. It's why Paul says it this way in 1 Thessalonians, test everything and hold on to the good. That's what we're going to do through this study. All right, you ready? Now look, Genesis chapter 24, and we're going to start in verses 1 and 2, and we're going to consider Abraham, and then we're also going to consider uh, Isaac, and we're going to consider Rebekah today. Look at what happens. Genesis chapter 24, and we'll start in verse 1. It says, Now Abraham was old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. Underline the Lord had blessed him in every way. 
He said to his chief servant in the household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. Now stop right there for just a minute. We're going to get into the weird things of man right off the bat in this passage, okay? Put your hand under my thigh was a way for them to swear in this particular household of the highest level of importance. Now let's be adults about this for a minute. The real thing, put your hand under my thigh is a really clean way of putting this. The real word there is put your hand on my loins, all right? Now, before we get into, that's like Monday night football. I like that. That's great. <laughs> Moving on. I don't know that that could have come at a better time than the loin passage. All right, there it is. All right. Okay, so listen. So here's what we got. Put your hand under my thigh. If you remember, Abraham, the connection he has with God is through the covenant of circumcision. And so here's the picture. This is a very, very important oath. What he's about to do, what he's about to, uh, the, the endeavor that he is about to go into, he says basically, this is by the sacred covenant. By the way that we know God, that's what I want you to swear to me by. Now, just for the record, Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, Jesus says we are dead to oaths and vows. And when he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount and he lists the different types of vows that we are free from, he does not list the hand under my thigh vow, but it is implied in that that you don't have to do that. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So here's the picture. The heart of Abraham in this passage is what we want to duplicate, you do not have to grab someone's loins in order to really mean it, all right? That's the picture. In the passage, he says, as far as this goes, how do you lay the foundation for a godly family? Number one, take it seriously. Write that down. Take it seriously. No one lucks into a godly family. Do you hear me? Nobody lucks into a godly family. You don't just roll snake eyes a billion times in a row and end up in a godly situation with a godly spouse where you're serving the Lord together and you're pursuing Christ in all things. That doesn't just happen. It's something that has to be intentionally pursued, and that is very important. Take it seriously. I'll never forget, went to Chicago for the first time, grew up in Lubbock, Texas, and guys, I didn't know cold weather. I go to Chicago in January Sam and Jess, you guys from Wisconsin area, you've been up there. It is cold. And that wind coming off the Great Lakes, it is frigid. So, so cold. And I'll never forget, I go to Chicago in January. Autumn and I are like barely married, not even a year. And I go to Chicago, and this is 17 years ago. When I go to Chicago, I get off the plane. There's snow on the ground. And all I had to wear, because in Lubbock, Texas, where I'm from, it gets cold, but it's cold because of the wind. So you wear a windbreaker, and you're pretty much okay. I have got for the Chicago winter a members-only jacket, and that is it, and a long sleeve shirt underneath it, long sleeve t-shirt underneath it. I get off the plane, and I am in big trouble. And so I call Autumn, and I'm like, we don't have any money, right? I'm flat broke. I'm going to freeze to death on the streets of Chicago right here. I did not plan correctly. And she says to me, I think I'm 24, I think 22, 20, or 23, 24, she's 22, and she goes, look, we have $100. She said, I'm going to introduce you to a place called the North Face Store, all right? And here's the deal. Changed my life forever, all right? She says, go to the North Face Store on the Magnificent Mile right there. And she said, go there. And she said, buy an Apex jacket. It's this old school North Face jacket, just black and white. And she said, that'll protect you from the elements. Well, sure enough, I go in. I try that jacket on, and it feels great. I still have it to this day. It pulls a little bit in the center, you know what I mean? But it's still a good jacket. As long as I can leave it unzipped, I'm in good shape, all right? So here's the deal. I get this Apex jacket. It's in great shape. It's incredibly durable. And right there by the counter, after spending all that time on the jacket, all of a sudden, I look over, and there's a pair of gloves just hanging right there next to the register. And I thought, oh, I should get gloves too. Because where I was from in Lubbock, Texas, gloves were just extra socks that you put on your hands for that one time that it snowed in a decade so that you could throw snowballs at your brother or sister. So again, instead of doing the sock thing, I thought it's probably time I'm adult. I should probably just go ahead and grab a pair of gloves. Well, they run through the register and then all of a sudden it rings up and they said, okay, that'll be 180 some odd dollars. And I said, what? And they go, well, you grabbed the gloves. They said, those are the fanciest gloves that we have on the market. They're right there next to the register. They knew what they were doing, all right? Grabbed the gloves, and then all of a sudden they look at me and they go, did you not mean 
to grab those gloves. And because I was young and foolish, I was like, no, of course I wanted those gloves. And all of a sudden, I spent money we did not have. And for the next 10 years, we paid on those gloves. No, I'm just kidding, right? (laughs) Can I tell you something? I still have those gloves to this day. That's what I use every winter. And I lucked into an incredible pair of gloves that have lasted me 17 years. They also had a little clippy on the end so the two of them stay together so you don't lose one. And I've made sure I tried to take care of them. Don't miss this. When it comes to the deepest parts of your life, the most important pieces, don't leave it to chance because you grabbed it as an impulse purchase by the register. You want it to be something that you truly were able to consider. And in your deepest level relationships, you guys work so stinking hard in this city that you can fall into, if I can't be with the one I love, love the one I'm with. It turns into proximity friendships. It turns into proximity deepest level relationships. And you just need to know, if you are limited in your deepest level relationships to whoever is closest to you, then you're going to miss out on some of the best people in your life. Is that a good word? Be intentional about those relationships. If you're taking notes, write this down. Be careful. And by the way, this goes for dating specifically. Okay. Be careful who you spend your time with. You might just fall in love with them. Okay. Be careful who you spend your time with. You might just fall in love with them. That was actually a line uh, from uh, my mother-in-law that she used to say to uh, my wife, Autumn, uh, when she was in high school. And here's the picture. When you are around a person for an extended period of time, When you let your guard down, by the way, that doesn't mean that you only need to work with your family, all right? The picture is that you come to a realization when you are looking for those deeper level relationships, if you let your guard down with those people who are around you, don't be surprised if all of a sudden relationship starts to sneak in. And so that means if you are already in a deeper level relationship, the godliest thing you can do is put up good, solid boundaries, not hateful boundaries, but good, strong boundaries so that you don't have a relationship that sneaks in that was never meant to be there. Amen. Amen. I'm teaching you power on this if you're listening. It begs the question, are you leaving some things to chance that you should be more intentional about? Let me ask that again. Are you leaving some things to chance that you should be more intentional about? We're about to go deeper into this. Look at what happens next in Genesis 24, and let's read verses 3 and 4. It says, I want you to swear by the Lord. Now remember, again, we don't have to swear. We're dead to oaths and vows. But he's letting us know he's taking this very seriously. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I'm living, but you will go to my country, to my own relatives, to get a wife for my son Isaac. Now stop right there for just a minute. What he's doing here is not condoning incest. That is very much against the faith uh, that Abraham and the Lord are founding together. What we have here is him saying that the covenant that we have with God is so important that that needs to be the defining characteristic in how our family is moving forward. If you're taking notes, write this down. You ready? How do you lay a foundation for a godly family? Number one, take it seriously. Nobody lucks into a godly family. And number two, place the highest value on shared faith. Place the highest value on shared faith. So many times, especially in this city, we place the highest value on image when the truth is the real deep nitty gritty stuff is how you stay together when difficulty hits. It's very easy to get together when everything looks good and Instagram clean on the outside. But what we've got to do is realize when those deeper level things come into play are when you are shaken to your very core by illness when you're shaken to your very core by debt, when you're shaken to your very core because you lose your job in an instant for absolutely no reason, which does happen out here quite often, or you lose a friendship that was so deep and so connected that you are not quite right after a time. After my father passed away, I wasn't right for a year and a half. I mean, I'm telling you, there were stretches where after the first six months, I would have a good day here and there, but it was six months before I even had one good day. It's not that way with every death, but with him, it was just that way. It was a year before I had a good week in a row, and then it was a year and a half before I could have a good month. Those deeper level relationships, when shared faith is what holds you together, that you took the vow between those witnesses present, but also before God, 
that's when you're able to stare at each other and go, I'm not right yet, but please don't give up. Stick with me. I'm trying to figure this thing out. You ever been fired before? I mean, that'll mess with you, won't it? I'm telling you. I quit without another job one time. It messed with me again for about a year and a half. I mean, here's the deal. Those deeper level relationships, if it's based on proximity, proximity can be gone in an instant. Those deeper level relationships have to be intentional. And you've got to make sure that the foundation, that the main thing, that the cornerstone is something that doesn't change. (laughs) When we put value on the wrong things, then it can get us in trouble. Think back for the very first car that you ever drove. Some of you in this room, some of you are looking forward to it. Dax, you're almost there, dude. You're very, very close. Think back to your first car. My parents told me back in the day, they said, hey, look, here's the deal. They said, whatever you save up this summer, they said, we'll double it, and that's what we'll spend on your first car. Now, here's the deal. At that time, I was like, yeah, I can probably, I'm 15, right? I was like, I can probably make a cool 25, 30 grand this summer. You know what I mean? And so it should, should be a, I'm looking at Z71 pickup trucks. You know, I'm looking at, at Broncos. I mean, all this stuff. Anyway, all that to say, I'll never forget. I worked that summer. After all my bills, after everything, I end up with $1,500. And so they were like, all right, three grand to spend on your car. I wanted a truck so badly. I'm a Texas kid. wanted a truck so badly. And sure enough, back in those days, I was a Chevy person too. And so I wanted a Chevy pickup. I didn't care if it was old. But I wanted a Chevy pickup and just wanted to be able to drive it around. Well, sure enough, we find one. It's black. It's a short bed. It's just, it's, it's perfect, okay? It just looks great. But here's the deal. You know what my two highest priorities were? And it's 16. You know what your big priorities are? I want it to be cool and I wanted it to be mine, all right? Those were the two things that I wanted above all else. Well, here's the thing about cool and mine. There's a lot of cars that are cool. There's a lot of cars that could be mine with $3,000. They did not need to be the two highest priorities that I had. So sure enough, we find this black truck. We go, and at the dealership, we go up, and I'll never forget, my mom and dad are there with me, and they were like, okay, son, you like this one? I'm like, it's perfect. This is what I want. Bench seat in the front. It was the short bed, too, so it was real sporty. And then I remember, I was like, let's pay them right here, right now. And dad goes, oh, no. He said, we got to test drive it. And of course, the guy at the dealership comes up and he goes, huh, we got a lot of people looking at this truck. There's always a lot of people looking at the same car, you know? We got a lot of people looking at this truck. And my dad goes, I'm not falling for it. And I'm like, please, I don't want a lot of people to take this truck from me. And he goes, we're going to test drive it. And the guy goes, all right, 24 hours, that's all you got. 24 hours, you can drive this truck. But he goes, I need to know first thing tomorrow if you're going to keep it. Drive it home. And it was awesome. Had the best experience driving that truck around. I then went and picked up one of my girlfriends. Had my dad sitting on the other side of the seat, but man, it was awesome going to do that. (laughs) Drive up. I'm telling you, had the best time. Well, then we parked it in front of the house, and you know the rest of the story. Walk out the next morning, and there is a dark pool underneath the entire truck. It had leaked oil all through the night. And then when we tried to start it, it wouldn't even start. The dealership had to send a tow truck and to tow it away. Running and a good investment should have been at the top of my list, right, of priorities. And instead, cool and mine, which were so broad that it made it to where just about any truck or any car would have passed that. Listen to me, when it comes to your deeper level relationships... Shared faith should not be 10th or 12th on your list. It should not be an afterthought in your premarital counseling before you get married. That's the way that you'll raise kids together. That's the way that you'll navigate conflict together. That's the way that you'll navigate the most difficult days of your life in your friendships. In the same way, your deeper level best friendships, that's how you'll navigate conflict together. That's how you'll navigate difficulty. That's how you'll talk to each other when one of your parents passes away. Make sure that the foundation that's laid is a good one. And by the way, if it's not, there is no judgment today. But if you get the choice on how to get it started, let's get it started the right way. If you're taking notes, write this down. Considering the values and faith of a potential partner on any level should never be an afterthought. Let me say that again. Considering the values and faith of a potential partner on any level should never be an afterthought. It begs the question, are you treating shared faith like it's a bonus? Yes, that again. 
Are you treating shared faith like it's a bonus? It is not a bonus. It is the foundational cornerstone. You got to make sure that you remember that. When you have trouble, and you will have trouble, the peace that we have is because of our foundation in Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. Look at the next part. Now flip back over to Genesis, and let's look at Genesis 24, verses 5 through 9. So the servant then asked him, asked Abraham, what if the woman's unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country that you came from? Look at this. Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, to your offspring, I will give you this land. Look at this. He will send his angel before you. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under his thigh. He said, all right, I'll do the oath with you. Master Abraham had swore with him with an oath that he uh, and swore in an oath concerning this matter. Now stop right there for just a minute. So the servant looks and goes, all right, you're sending me to get a wife for your son. What if she doesn't want to come with me? What do I do then? And Abraham goes, the Lord's going to go before you. He said, if it doesn't work, then you're released to your oath. Then you can come on back and there's no big deal. It's a beautiful picture here that this is nothing that's being coerced or forced in this situation. When we read Rebecca's story next week, you'll get to see that in full force. It's beautiful the way that it comes together. But listen, Abraham says, I have a deep relationship with Yahweh. He said, in order for my son to be a good father, a good husband, he also is going to have to know and love Yahweh the same way that I do. His faith is going to have to be his own. That's why he says, don't send my son to try to coerce her. He said, the Lord needs to be the one that sets this up. Now, just for the record, if you are a parent in this room and praying through a forever partner for your spouse, take a page out of the book of Abraham. Nothing is forced. Nothing is coerced. Instead, they invite God. He invites God to be part of the story and part of the process. Nothing ticks your kids off more than when you try to set them up with somebody. All right. Is that a good word, kids? All right. Do I get an amen right there? There it is. That should have been louder. All right. All that to say. Here's the deal. They don't like that. So what do you do as a parent? Abraham prays for the Lord to make himself evident in the circumstance. If you're taking notes, write this down. Are you ready? Again, how do you lay the foundation for a godly family? Number one, take it seriously. Number two, place the highest value on shared faith. And number three, invite the Lord to be part of the process. Invite the Lord to be part of the process. As you go through your story with any deeper level relationship, you can spot God in the story, and sometimes he comes up as the one pushing you into the situation, and sometimes he comes up as the one on the back of the stagecoach pulling you back and telling you to slow down. And then sometimes, this has been my experience, sometimes he is nowhere to be found in the process, not because he doesn't care, but because he knows that I've got to learn this one the hard way, all right? Now listen, where is God in your pursuit of this relationship? Where is God in your pursuit of this deeper level friendship? You ever seen the old play? It's beautiful. Fiddler on the Roof. You ever seen Fiddler on the Roof? I love it. The fiddler in the show is the one who's symbolic of the presence of Yahweh God. And so he's kind of this squirrely little character. And there's points where he's on the road and just kind of walking through playing his song. Then there's other points where he's perched there at the wedding, overlooking at the beautiful things that are happening. In the times of difficulty, he's over there watching sternly. Here's the picture. In your life decisions, where is God when you are making these deeper level connections? Is it something that he is affirming as you go through the process? Or is it something that he is adamantly standing against or sitting there and going, man, I can't have any part with this one? This isn't just dating and marriage. It also goes with friendships and big business decisions. There is no bigger business decision in a church other than the hiring of the pastor than when you go in pursuit of your worship pastor. And guys, our church went to a completely different level when the Lord sent us Denver Duncan. Denver's the best. Absolute gift from God to us. Now, here's the picture. Just so you know, can I tell you one of the reasons why? Did you ever go to a friend's house growing up? 
And the friend's parents fought like cats and dogs or hated each other. And they may have had the pool table. They may have had the air hockey table. They may have had the ping pong table. And they may have had the swimming pool and the hot tub. But here's the deal. You would go over there and use the amenities because you felt bad for your friend. But you never invited anybody else to go and be part of it. Listen, that's church work. Father and mother are the pastor and the worship leader. We share the platform together. And here's the deal. When the pastor and worship leader hate each other, you may continue to come to the church because you love it and because they've taken care of you over the years, but you don't invite any of your friends when there's not peace on the platform. So that peace is incredibly important. So we've been without a worship leader for a year and a half, and all of a sudden, my friend Shane calls, and he says, hey, I got your worship leader. It's a guy named Denver Duncan. Now, you've got to remember this. Waterfront is a church of 150 people at that point, not big. And Denver had just the week before led worship at a church of five to 8,000 called Henderson Hills in Oklahoma City. So Shane sets it up and he goes, I think Denver might want to make a move. So I'm like, okay, I drive six hours out of the way from an event I was doing in Texas so that I can meet with Denver in Oklahoma City. I pull up and he had just hung out with his in-laws that we find out were in Washington, D.C., Bill and Peggy stationed in Washington with the military. And then all of a sudden, he is wearing a Washington football hat at the breakfast, and he didn't know that I was from Washington. He comes in, sits down, and I'm just talking, going, man, Lord, it seems like you are involved in this process. And then all of a sudden, he says the magic words. I was like, hey, you want to move to D.C. and you want to work with us? And he goes, I just took a job last week. And immediately, I look at Shane, and I'm like, glad I drove out of the way, Shane. You know what I mean? (laughs) thanks a lot. You know what I mean? Six hours out of the way. I'm a little angry, all right? And so at that point, I look over at Denver, and I go, well, here's the deal. If you want to go run that big church's system, you can go run their system. But if you want to come and be a part of something new where you can use all your creative muscles, then come and work with us. I mean, it really was spoken more in anger than anything else, you know? And it was a terrible sales pitch, but I was like, all right, we'll throw it out there. And Denver was like, I appreciate that. It's great to get to meet you. And he walks out the door. I get in the car with Shane. And I'm like, thanks a lot, Shane. Thanks a lot. This was ridiculous. And he goes, no, man, couldn't you feel it? Spirit was all over that thing. The Lord's moving. The Lord's working. I was like, what are you talking about? He took another job. And so then Shane was so funny. Shane was like, what do you want, man? You want him to just lay down his nets and follow you? He's got kids. I mean, I remember him saying that. It was great. <laughs> I had said to Denver at the end, I said, if you're interested, give me a call. I said, or I think I said, actually, I said, if, if you're interested, I said, I'm going to call you later this weekend. He goes to the church in Oklahoma City. This is crazy. He goes to the church, and he and his wife, Heather, right before the first service, or right before the, uh, right before the first service, there's three services that day. Right before the service, they pray, Heather prays, Lord, let us be ready to die here. I did not that they would die in the church but that they would truly be willing to stay there and this would be a place they could be for a long time. Denver gets up, leads the first service, and between the second and third services, a guy walks in, falls over of a heart attack, and dies at the back of the service. They're in Denver's ear telling him to start playing and to start the service, and Denver says, no, 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 we got to be able to hear the compressions, and we got to make sure that we, we give this guy a shot. And so sure enough, the guy does pass away, and then all of a sudden... He goes to his wife and he goes, you said die here. I don't want to die here. I want an adventure. Now, just for the record, I don't think God killed that guy so that Denver would come up here. Not saying that, all right? But it shook him awake. And all of a sudden, in the midst of that process, he calls me and he goes, are you going to call me or not? Tells the story and I'm like, my speech worked. You know what I mean? (laughs) He tells me the story of what happened. You know what's crazy? He wasn't just a gift to you. He wasn't just a gift on the stage on Sunday mornings. Denver is a person of peace. The staff refer to him regularly as the emotional support animal because he comes (laughs) alongside and he just calms everything down. He has that gift. He stands next to you and it just is, he just gives you strength. He gives you courage. He's a real gift. His kids are my kid's age. At a time when our church was so small that they didn't have many friends, Denver wasn't the fulfillment of one prayer. He fulfilled about 30. Here's the deal. Where was God in the process? 
nudging forward every step of the way. In your deeper level relationships, in your deeper level commitments to one another, in your yoked relationships, I want to encourage you, ask God to be a part of it. Abraham says, there's an angel that's going to be walking with you. You're not going to be able to see him, but that angel's going to be with you every step of the way. Begs the uh, statement, you ready? Through introduction, affirmation, discouragement, cautioning, or perceived absence. The Lord's presence in our situation says a lot. Through introduction, affirmation, discouragement, cautioning, or perceived absence, the Lord's presence says a lot. It begs, the final, it begs our question in this section. Where is God positioned in your partnership? Where is God positioned in the story of your partnership? If he's saying don't do it, then don't stink and do it. If he's saying go on ahead, then go on ahead. If he's strategically silent, look deep within yourself and figure out what that means too, because I got a feeling you know. But that's not all. Look at what happens next. This is so cool. You ready? Genesis 24, verses 10 through 14, and this is so anti-DC. Are you ready for this? Watch this. This is a great verse, great set of verses. It says, so then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and left, taking with him all kinds of good things from the master. He set out for Aram in Naharim and then made his way to the town of Nahor. Watch this. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside of the town. It was towards the evening, the time that the women go out to draw water. Now watch this prayer of the servant. Then he prayed, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. Look at this. See, I am standing beside the spring and, I, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when, they, that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Underline drink and I'll water your camels too. So let her be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master today. Stop right there for just a minute. He doesn't just come in and say, all right, Lord, whoever's the most beautiful person, that must be who it is that you've set aside for Isaac. No, instead, he comes back and says, I have a need, and whoever it is that comes, I'll ask them if I can have some water. And if they say, oh, not just you, but I perceive that your camels are also in need of water as well, man, I will take care of them as well. If you're taking notes, write this down. Are you ready? So practical. How do you lay the foundation for a godly family? Take it seriously. Place a high value on shared faith. Invite the Lord to be part of the process. And number four, notice deeds and kindness before wealth and beauty. Notice deeds and kindness before wealth and beauty. Now, before we ugly people rise up and go, it's finally our day, all right? Can I just tell you a little secret? I've known some pretty stinking lazy ugly people over the years. I've also known some incredibly kind and godly Good-looking people. We hate you, by the way. Just want you to know that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Look at me. The looks, the looks are so much further down the list. Kindness, humility, the deeds and the acts of service. Man, that's what you look for. That's what's supposed to be high on the list. That doesn't mean that God wants you to marry an ugly person. It means that what the Lord wants you to do is bind yourself to people who do things of eternal, that are eternal in nature and last. Can I tell you why we don't do that? Because of pornography and marketing. Pornography and marketing have screwed you up. At some point, you're going to figure out how to legislate it. But we are the generation that pornography and marketing have completely destroyed anything in our head that is truly of value. And you have to be retrained in order to be able to see things the right way. So guess what? In this passage, the guy comes in and goes, I don't want to mess this up. And what does our family need? Not what can we acquire? Not what, what does she bring to the table? Instead, he comes in and says, I have a perceived need. Is she the type of person that would come up and say, not only you, but I see that your camels are in need too. Let me help and assist there as well. He's not looking for a servant. He's looking for a partner. That's what we've got to do, too. If you're taking notes, write this down. Train your eyes to look for attributes that don't flee or fade. 
Train your eyes to look for attributes that don't flee or fade. Guys, I'm in love with my wife. Almost 19 years of marriage. It'll be 19 years in January. And I'm in love with her. Can I just tell you this? We went on our first date. And then three weeks after we went on our first date, we went on a mission trip to Los Angeles. And uh, it was over, uh, two, over 200 college students that were on this mission trip. It was amazing. Worked in Riverside Baptist Church there in California. Um, it was just a wonderful experience. Built a stage, and then we also built a baptistry at the church. It just was a wonderful experience. Can I tell you what happened? We would serve all day in the mornings. We'd worship in the early evenings, and then those of us who already graduated, which I was a part of that group, would go back for a second shift and work until 11 p.m. I mean, it was, it was grueling. You know the day I knew I was in love with my wife? We'd been dating for three weeks. Now, I didn't tell her that soon. But I'm working on the stage, and all of a sudden she walks up, and she has got over her shoulder 10-foot-long two-by-fours. And she's carrying them and dropping them off to the different portions that are working on the stage. She's got those 10-foot two-by-fours over her shoulder, sweat on her brow, grin on her face. And I was like, that's the hottest thing I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) When I look at her now, I still see that. That's how she's loved our kids. That's how she's loved me. That's how she's loved our church. Wealth and beauty are part of the equation. They are not the most important things. Train your eyes to see them for what they are. And don't place such a high priority on them that you miss out on something so special. Begs the final question. Are you looking for the right things in a partner? Are you looking for the right things in a partner? I still don't know how to preach during this time slot, and so we're way out of time, all right? Don't miss it, okay? This message was for you. Lay those foundations correctly, and again, let's make sure that we try our very best to train our eyes to see what God sees. Let's bow our heads for prayer.